Chapter Thirteen of A Little Florida Lady by Dorothy C. Payne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Anxious Hours. One day, a strange white dog appeared at the Davenports. No one knew whence she came. Perhaps Duke enticed her to the house. He tried to bespeak Beth's interest by barking vigorously and jumping up and down wildly, as if begging the child to keep her. At first it was hard for Beth to feel any interest in the dog. It was fearfully thin, and always acted as if it expected to be kicked. It had one redeeming feature, in that its eyes were very beautiful. They were large and brown, with a mildly pathetic look that appealed to Beth's soft heart, so that she decided to keep the dog. For the first few days the newcomer sneaked under the house when anyone was around. When she saw, however, that she was left unmolested, she gained courage. Duke was all devotion, and the white dog thrived under such attention. She freshened up so well that Beth wondered how she ever thought the dog ugly. Kindness and good food work wonders with dogs as well as with people. The days of her stay lengthened into months. One morning Beth came running in from the barn, her eyes brilliant from excitement. "'Mama! Mama!' she cried. "'What do you think? White dog!' They had never given her a name. "'Has seven of the cutest little puppies you ever saw. Duke took me out and showed them to me.' Duke took you out? Yes, Mama. When I went out to play with him this morning, he caught hold of my dress and tried to pull me towards the barn. I thought he was just playing, but when he did it the second time, I followed him, and he led me to White Dog and the puppies. Oh, they're the cutest things you ever saw. Beth watched the growth of the puppies with great interest. She was delighted when their eyes opened, and when they began to run around, she was almost too happy for words. That night she said to her papa, "'I've been thinking about Mr. Brown. He must miss Duke awfully. He wasn't such a horrid man, after all, or he wouldn't have let me keep Duke.' Mr. Davenport smiled. "'Beth, a man was talking to me about him today. The man said Brown was trying to reform, that he hadn't taken any liquor.' For some time past. I was very glad to hear it." Beth pondered a minute or two, then asked, "'Do you think if he had a dog now he'd be nice to it?' "'Yes, I believe he would. Brown wasn't half bad except when he drank. But you're not thinking of giving Duke back to him, are you?' Beth shook her head very vigorously. "'I couldn't do that, Papa. I love Duke too much.' She said no more, but got out paper and pencil. She was backward in all schooling at this time, and could only print. However, she sat down at the table beside her father, and went to work. It proved a very difficult task to her, but she persevered until she finished. Most of the correctly spelled words she learned from her father. This is what she wrote. To Duke's master, Duke has puppies. Would you like a pup? I haven't thanked you for Duke, but I love Duke very much, and I think you a nice man to give Duke to me. Your little friend, Beth Davenport. She put the note in an envelope and sealed it. Then she said to her father, Papa, will you give this to Mr. Brown? He's to have one of Duke's puppies if he wants it. Mr. Davenport delivered the note as desired. The next afternoon, Beth saw a buggy turn in at their place, and presently she discerned Mr. Brown within it. She waited, half bashful, until he drove up. He leapt from the buggy and raised his hat. Beth was delighted, because in every way he seemed so much improved. "'I've come for the puppy.' "'It's in the barn. I'll get it for you,' cried Beth, running there as fast as she could. Duke was playing with the puppies. When Beth appeared and took one, he followed her out, but at sight of his former owner he stopped still. Mr. Brown, however, called out pleasantly, "'Hello, Duke. I'm not going to take you away. 
Won't you come to me? Come, nice dog. Duke must have felt the transformation in his former master, for he allowed Mr. Brown to pat him. Beth did not say a word, but held out the puppy. Mr. Brown took it and said, a little brokenly, I'm not used to making nice speeches to little girls, but you're very good to give this puppy to me. Why, it's nothing at all. Didn't you give me Duke? murmured Beth. He hesitated an instant. But it means a great deal to me. It shows that you trust me. Missy, I promise never to strike this one as long as I have him. Good-bye. Thereupon he jumped into the buggy and drove away. Beth returned to the barn with Duke. January, as usual, was idling. He had his fiddle and was playing Dixie. Beth sat down on the hay near him, while the dog family frolicked around her. She was happy, so happy, that from sheer light-heartedness she began to sing. Duke pricked up his ears. White Dog cocked her head to one side, and the six puppies followed their parents' example. Duke uttered a low, deep howl that chimed in with Beth's singing. White Dog howled in a high soprano, and the six little dogs did likewise, but in shriller tones. Beth was so surprised that she stopped singing, and the dogs immediately ceased howling, evidently waiting for Beth to lead them. She began to sing again, and the dogs began to howl, swaying their heads from side to side. Their howling was so funny that Beth had to laugh, January joining in. Beth then ran into the house for Mrs. Davenport. "'Mama, come and hear the concert!' she cried. "'What concert?' "'Come with me, and you'll see, if they'll do it again. It's the funniest singing you ever heard.' Beth led her mother to the barn. "'Where are the singers?' asked Mrs. Davenport. "'Wait,' answered Beth, calling the dogs to her. Then she began singing, and the dogs began howling, holding their heads high in the air. Duke, however, proved lazy. He would come in only once in a while with his deep bass, but this made the effect more funny. Mrs. Davenport laughed over the performance until her sides ached. That afternoon Beth and the dogs had another concert for the benefit of Mr. Davenport and Marion. In the evening the Gordons and the Bakers called, and, hearing of the wonderful concert, they insisted upon a repetition of it. The lantern was brought in, therefore, and, with Beth heading the procession, the party adjourned to the barn. The dogs were asleep, but at the first sound of Beth's shrill little voice they all, even to the smallest pup, pricked up their ears and then howled in concert. After that, Beth's concert became famous. People drove out from Jacksonville to see and hear the canine musicale. After a time, Beth trained the dogs so that they would sit up in a row on their hind legs while they sang. They were apparently carried away by the music, and appeared quite human in their vanity, swaying their bodies and rolling their eyes in a very ludicrous manner, while howling in accompaniment to Beth's singing. Duke greatly endeared himself to the Davenports by his wonderful sagacity. He could almost talk. One of the very smartest things he ever did happened in this wise. Beth had a sudden attack of fever. "'We must have a doctor,' said Mrs. Davenport. Beth overheard the remark. Since her experience of the stitches under her nose, she hated all doctors. So she declared, "'I don't want any horrid doctor. I'll get well without one. Really, I will.' Mrs. Davenport laid a cooling hand on her head, and said soothingly, can't you trust Mama to do what is best? Thereupon she gave private instructions to Mr. Davenport to get a doctor as soon as possible, after which she neglected all work, trying to keep Beth quiet. Two little kittens, brothers of those brought by Gustus in the winter, crawled up on the lounge, ready for play. 
Even their antics tired Beth. When the doctor came, he looked serious over the child's condition. She must be put to bed immediately, was his first order. I'll have her carried upstairs, said Mrs. Davenport. The doctor was a very blunt man, and declared plainly, She's too sick to be moved. Have a bed brought in here if you can. Without arguing the question, Mrs. Davenport ordered the servants to bring down an iron cot. Her commands were carried out quietly and with haste, and soon Beth was undressed and in bed. She was delirious by this time, and did not even note that a doctor was present. He studied the case silently for a few minutes. He was a well-meaning man, but a doctor of the old school. He believed that if medicine was a good thing, the more one took the better. Also, if dieting was good, semi-starvation was better. He therefore wrote out five or six pr prescriptions, all of very strong drugs. He also ordered that she should be fed only on gruels. Duke seemed to grieve over Beth's illness extremely. He would not play with the puppies, and would eat hardly anything. At first he walked into the room where Beth was, and lay down beside her cot. When he saw he was in the way there, he took up his position on the piazza outside the door, and could hardly be induced to move. Even White Dog failed to entice him away. Anxious times followed for the Davenports. The fear of losing Beth made each member of the family realize, as never before, how very dear the little mischievous child was to them. She was mischievous no longer, however. She was so patient that Mrs. Davenport feared more than ever that she would die. Often Beth would smile so beatifically that her mother thought she must be thinking of angels and heaven. Dearie, of what are you thinking? she once asked. Beth's face was illumined with a more heavenly light than ever as she drew a long breath and answered, Oh, Mama, I was thinking how good some bologna sausage or anything besides horrid old gruel would taste. The truth of the matter was that the child was half starved. Still, the doctor insisted that she should have nothing but mutton or rice gruel, and those only in very small quantities. Under such treatment she wasted to a mere shadow of her former chubby self. She proved a tyrant in one respect, in that she would have no one but her mother to watch her. If Mrs. Davenport left the room when Beth was awake, Beth at once worried herself into a high fever. The strain was telling upon Mrs. Davenport, but so great was her anxiety that she would hardly take needed rest. One day Beth was asleep, and Maggie tiptoed into the room and whispered to Mrs. Davenport, "'Dear Miss Mary, won't you please let this old mammy watch the honey lamb for just a little while? You knows I love her with all my heart, and I wouldn't let nothing harm the pet for the world. You'll go into the other room and rest a while. If the precious lamb wants you, I'll call right away, honest. Thus urged, Mrs. Davenport decided to grant Maggie's request, and she left the room without disturbing Beth's slumbers. Maggie sat down by the cot. The sight of Beth, so emaciated, melted Maggie almost to tears. She thus soliloquized. That horrid old medicine man, he just ought to be made to live on gruels the rest of his life, so he ought. It's just terrible to starve the child the way he does. I'd like to be her doctor a while. I'd order chicken and possum and— Suddenly Beth's eyes opened. Maggie, what did you cook for dinner today? Maggie confided to her husband afterwards. Law, Titus! Don't you think I could sit up there and tell that precious child we had chicken when I knew her little stomach was just groaning for chicken? No deed. Do I am deaconess. I'd rather be burned for a lie. So I just answers as pert like as possible. La, honey, we just had mutton like your broth is made of. Beth, however, was not to be deceived. 
Her senses had grown unusually acute during her sickness. She pointed her finger at Maggie and said, "'Maggie, that's not true. You had chicken and biscuits, for I smelled them. Oh, I'm so hungry!' Maggie sighed sympathetically. "'La, honey, would you like some broth?' "'Broth!' repeated Beth, almost in tears. "'I hate broth. I'll starve before I eat any more. I want chicken. Please, please, get me some.' The appeal melted Maggie completely. She arose and called Duke from the doorway. "'Duke,' she said, pointing to the cot, "'don't you let anyone come near Missy till I come back. Do you understand?' The delighted dog wagged his tail, and Maggie left the room. Duke's first impulse was to rush up to the cot and show his joy in true dog fashion. He longed to cover Beth's face and hands with kisses. He knew, however, that excitement was bad for her. He therefore walked quietly up to the cot and laid his head down beside his little playmate as if inviting a caress. She put a weak little hand on his head. "'Yes, Duke, I know you love me.' Maggie re-entered the room. In her hand was a plate, and on that plate was a large slice of white chicken meat. Beth's eyes glistened at sight of it. "'Da, honey child, they just shan't starve you to death. Here am a whole lot of chicken for you.' Beth grabbed the plate. "'Oh, Maggie, it's, it's heavenly!' Suddenly Maggie heard Mrs. Davenport approaching. Her eyes rolled tragically. La, honey, it's your ma. Hide the chicken under your pillow. I'll get rid of her, and then yo can eat the chicken in peace. Quick, honey, or she'll take it away from you. Beth put the plate with the chicken under her pillow. Maggie tried to look unconcerned. Mrs. Davenport entered the room. Well, my dear is awake, is she? Oh, mamma, I'm so hungry. I do wish I could have a piece of chicken. No, no, dearie, that would never do. I'll get you some lovely mutton broth. Tears rose in Beth's eyes. I don't want broth. Oh, yes, you do, dearie. Mrs. Davenport left the room to get the broth. Maggie went to the bed and drew out the chicken. Quick, honey, you'll eat it while she's gone, and she need never know. Beth's eyes feasted on the chicken for a second or two. She halfway put out a hand for it, but quickly drew it back again. No, Maggie, it wouldn't be honorable. La, child, you'll better eat it. Your mamma find me with it, and then she'll blame me. Beth held up her hand for the plate. She looked at the chicken very longingly, and Maggie thought that she had made up her mind to eat it. She did take up the meat. But she held it out to Duke, saying, "'It'll be honorable for you to eat it, Duke, and then mamma will never blame Maggie. It was very nice of you, Maggie, to get it for me, but I couldn't deceive mamma." Duke gulped the meat down at one swallow, much to the envy of Beth. She held out the empty plate to Maggie. "'Take it away, Maggie. The smell of it makes me so dreadfully hungry.' Maggie took it and left the room muttering. It's terrible shame, a terrible shame. Mrs. Davenport came in with the steaming broth. Here, dearie, is your broth. Beth burst into tears. I can't eat it. I just can't touch the horrid stuff. Please take it away. Her mother did not attempt to argue the question. That afternoon, when the doctor came, she asked, isn't there something else we can feed her on, doctor? He pondered for a moment. Well, she seems to be improving a little, and if we could get a bird or a rabbit, we might make her some broth out of that. I think rabbit broth would be delicious, cried Beth rapturously. Mrs. Davenport said, We'll send January to town to see if we can get a rabbit or a quail. An hour or later, January returned and reported, there ain't no rabbit or no bird in the market, Miss Mary. Beth was very much disappointed, but was pacified, however, by the assurance that darkies would be sent out to hunt rabbits in the morning.
She even consented to take a little rice gruel, cheered by the prospects of having something better on the morrow. In the morning, when the darkies were ready for hunting rabbits, Mrs. Davenport said to Duke, "'Go with him, old fellow. Perhaps you can chase a rabbit down for your little mistress. She wants a rabbit very, very much.' He seemed to understand, for he rose and went with the hunters. Rabbit hunting was his favorite pastime. Therefore he displayed the first signs of joy that he had shown since Beth's sickness. He bounded lightly across the fields, sniffing the ground expectantly. At first the darkies were encouraged by his manner, and followed him on and on. When, however, they had gone many miles, and most of the forenoon passed without Dukes scaring up a single rabbit for them, they became discouraged. In fact, they returned to the house and reported their ill luck to Mrs. Davenport. "'I reckon dis ain't time for rabbits. We didn't see a single one all dis time.' "'Where is Duke?' asked Mrs. Davenport. The darkies grinned. "'Oh, dat fool dog!' He ain't got no sense at all. We tried to get him to come with us, but he went on sniffin' as if he was just bound to have a rabbit, even when there ain't none. Well, said Mrs. Davenport, with feeling, I only wish you had half the perseverance of Duke. If he could understand like you, he would go until he dropped before he'd give up. She therefore had to go to Beth and report their failure. The poor child cried and cried. She was so very much disappointed. "'I'll I'll starve, and I'm so terribly hungry,' she moaned. "'Dearie, if you'll only take some gruel, I'll get you the most beautiful doll you ever saw, or a ring, or anything you wish.' At the moment, even this promise failed in appealing to Beth. She desired rabbit more than anything else in the world." "'Won't you please try some gruel, dear? Won't you, to please me?' "'I'll I'll try, but I don't believe I can swallow a bit of the nasty stuff. I want rabbit.' Mrs. Davenport hurried away to get the gruel. Left to herself, Beth continued to cry. "'I don't believe God cares for me, or He'd have sent me a rabbit. I asked Him last night when I prayed. Miss Smith!' Her Sunday school teacher says God always answers prayer if it is good for one, and I'm sure Rabbit is good for me. The tears came a little faster. She says, though, one must ask awfully hard. Perhaps I don't ask hard enough. I'll ask again. Beth folded her hands and closed her eyes. Dear God, I can't eat gruel any more. I'll die if I have to eat gruel, and I don't want to die. I want Rabbit. It would seem that the days of miracles had not passed, for even while she prayed, she felt two paws rest on her cot. She opened her eyes, and there was Duke, waiting impatiently for her to notice him. She could hardly believe her eyes, for in his mouth he held a little live rabbit, as if for her to take it. To make sure she was not dreaming, she stretched forth her hand for the rabbit. Duke let her take it, without offering the least resistance. In fact, he looked at her as much as to say, I heard them say that my little mistress wanted a rabbit. I was bound she should have a rabbit, and here it is. Mrs. Davenport entered the room. Here is your broth, dear. Take it away, cried Beth exultingly. I'm going to have a rabbit. God sent Duke to bring me one. Wasn't he good not to eat it himself? He always used to eat them when he caught them, and God was so good to me, too. The speech appeared a little ambiguous to Mrs. Davenport, but it was all very plain to the child. Never did a stew seem more delicious to any one than did that rabbit stew to Beth. In fact, it proved a turning point with her, the fever subsiding thereafter very rapidly. End of Chapter 13